Well, here we go, folks. Welcome back to Trees in the Main Forest. Going to be doing things a little bit differently here for a while, a little remote learning. Uh, if you're watching this video, that means you've logged into Google Classroom and found today's lesson and fired her up on YouTube. I'm, I'm just running a, kind of a big channel here these days. Go ahead and uh, click subscribe if you want to uh, get all these videos and notifications when they appear. Uh, but let's jump right in today. We're going to talk about... Um, our next batch of trees today, we're gonna to add five more. We're gonna be up to 15 species of broadleaf trees at the end of today. Um, we're gonna go through these here fairly quickly. I'm gonna post the Kahoot link to our class feed in Google Classroom so you can practice uh, identification of these species as much as you want. And then we'll uh, round out today with a little uh, profile assignment that I'll go over here in a little bit. But let's jump in and take a look at our tree species, uh, our next five. I have these grouped because I call them recent clearing trees. These are the, some of the, the pioneer species, the first trees to appear after a clear cut or a forest fire or any sort of disturbance in the forest. And that's gonna be kind of a trend, uh, a buzzword that we talk about in, in with these trees uh, is disturbance, this idea that uh, um, we can uh, blow trees over with a storm or as I said, have a fire or human harvest or any reason. Uh, we call that disturbance and more on that next class let's jump in and talk about these five species here and some of the things that we're looking for on each of them the first one we're going to talk about here is paper birch uh, commonly referred to by a lot of mainers around here as just white birch we see this tree it's really distinct looking because of its really white showy bark um, but the paper birch betula papyrifera kind of an easy one to remember because of that Papyrifera makes me think of paper, and all birches you're going to notice are members of that same genus, Betula. So just like Acer makes me think maple and Quercus makes me think oak. When I hear Betula, I'm thinking birch, and then I can check the species name and really try to hone in on what I'm looking at here. So Betula papyrifera, paper birch. When I look at a paper birch leaf, I notice a leaf that is uh, almost heart-shaped. We call it ovate. Uh, and finely toothed. It's pinnate and simple, as you can see there. Uh, we, we find this tree commonly statewide, um, and that bark on the mature tree, and I'm saying mature there uh, because young trees are often very yellow or even brown or black looking, but as they mature, they become really white, and the bark tends to peel easily. Um, a lot of people love to tear on that bark, and uh, it's okay to take a, a little bit of that, a uh, little bit frill that's coming off there. It makes a great fire starter even when wet. A little uh, Mr. D's survival tip for you there. Um, but we don't want to peel that bark back too far because we start peeling back into the, uh, the live living bark section of the tree and we can, you know, start to do damage and maybe possibly girdle that tree if we peel bark all the way around it. And this was uh, the species Native Americans would have used to make those birch bark canoes that we've talked about in class. Um, but as with all these species, it's what we call an early successional species. Uh, it has a very short lifespan compared to other trees. It shows up first out in these open, disturbed areas um, and uh, grows very, very quick, quickly. Uh, really important tree. Um, it produces uh, food for quite a bit of wildlife as well as cover. It grows in these really thick stands. So paper birch, uh, Betula papyrifera. Um, let's let's take a look here real quick, and uh, we'll look at Betula papyrifera bark. We'll go Betula papyrifera. Um, if we just take a look at the bark here, we'll see. Oh, oh yeah, that's good stuff. Look at this. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Betula papyrifera. Look at that kind of classic bark. Um, and if we go back here, we refine our search. Let's go Betula papyrifera leaf. And uh, we'll look at a variety of leaves here. Oh, Gary Fuelist, where are you? Come on, Gary. He's got to have some shots in here. Classic Gary. He's always going to have a black background uh, and uh, his copy right down there at the bottom. I don't know. I don't see him. I'm worried. We'll, we'll have to keep looking around here. But you'll notice some variety in Betula papyrifera, um, but fairly round leaf. It tapers towards the end, and it's, uh, it's finely toothed all the way around. Um, there's a pretty classic shot there of uh, Betula Happy Riffera. And we got to be careful because our birches are all fairly similar. There's the shot from our, our slideshow right there. Um, yeah, Betula Papyrifera. Good stuff. Let's go back uh, and take a look here 
and continue on. So uh, close cousin of Betula papyrifera and often mistaken for paper birch. A lot of people see this tree as they're walking along the Eastern Trail or anywhere in the Maine woods. It's got a similar look to it. It's got a similar coloration in many instances and people go, oh, look, a white birch. When in reality, they're looking at gray birch, Betula populifolia, populifolia. And I think that's a tribute to uh, how similar it looks to a tree we're going to look at later on today. Populifolia, that's gray birch. Now, if you look at that leaf, you're going to notice how triangular it is. It's uh, really uh, almost doubly serrate, and it's very, very triangular, wide at the base, and it tapers down to this long, skinny uh, point down towards the end of the leaf there on gray birch. The bark can appear similar to paper birch. It's very light in color, but it very rarely peels as much as paper birch. Um, and I'll show you some examples here in a minute. This is another early successional species uh, down east down there in Washington County where I used to do a lot of rabbit hunting in, in uh, college. Uh, man, was there gray birch absolutely everywhere along the sides of those dirt roads where the forest had been uh, disturbed. And we have plenty of it around here in southern Maine as well. When I think of gray birch, I think of sand pits. They love to grow in old abandoned uh, sand pits and just areas of really recent disturbance that other trees aren't going to colonize very quickly. Gray birch will come in and set up these big, huge stands of lots of little spindly stems, um, and you'll see them around. So uh, we'll point them out as we get back in person. We'll walk around and see a lot of gray birch. Another classic sign of gray birch is these trees that are bent over and hanging in the woods. They really don't do well with ice storms, and once they've been uh, kind of collapsed by an ice storm, they really don't rebound very well, and they become kind of permanently... Uh, uh, rainbow shaped out in the woods hanging over trails things like that so the gray birch if we go back here and we look at Betula uh, let's look at Betula populifolia and uh, let's see let's look up the leaves first leaf check it out here we go check out how triangular that leaf is long and skinny triangular leaf Really classic of Betula populifolia gray birch. Really wide at the base and long, uh, thin tip there. Doubly serrate, you could say. Um, gray birch leaf. And it's really distinct, that long um, pointed end on the leaf. There. There's a classic shot of Betula populifolia gray birch. Let's go back to Nearpod here. Uh, okay, we got two species down. We got paper birch, we got gray birch. The, it wouldn't be right to not talk about our other common birch uh, around the main forest here, and that's going to be yellow birch. Again, Betula, a member of the same genus, but this time Betula alleghaniensis. And I've got it misspelled here in my slideshow. There's a, there should be a G right in front of that H. Alleghaniensis um, is a yellow birch. Uh, and this guy is really unique to the birch family. I'll often show you the bark of the tree in the background on Kahoot and on quizzes and things like that because um, I think this tree looks really similar to elm the, in terms of its leaf, although the bark is super distinct. Um, it looks very similar to elm. It's a pinnate, uh, simple leaf. It's finely toothed, although elm is doubly serrate. This thing is finely toothed. It, you could even confuse it for beech maybe, similar shape and, and uh, veins there. But um, again, that bark is really unique, and we'll look at it as we get outside. I may even film some vids walking around the woods here uh, during our, our time away to do some tree ID walks. I think that'll be kind of cool. So, um, but if we look here, we're going to see uh, Betula alleghaniensis, that yellow birch. I'll show you some images here in a little bit. One of my favorite trees in the Maine woods. I just love finding a nice yellow birch out there. Um, the bark on the mature tree doesn't look anything like uh, paper or gray birch. It does have a yellowish brown appearance, but it does peel off a little bit um, in small curls. And when they get really old, that bark becomes really, really cool looking. Um, and the buds and twigs are really uh, diagnostic in that you, you snap a twig and you smell it and it smells exactly like wintergreen. Um, you can chew on it, it, it tastes good. Um, and we used to actually harvest wintergreen from these trees. Nowadays, it's all kind of uh, man-made wintergreen flavoring and gums, but that used to come from the yellow birch tree. And there's a thing called birch bark, which has kind of a wintergreen flavor. I'm um, sorry, birch beer, which uh, uh, is made with yellow birch, um, that, that uh, extract from yellow birch. If we go back here and we look up Betula alleghaniensis, let's take a look here. Betula alleghaniensis. Here we go, let's look at images. 
Um, here we go. There's that classic bark on a, you know, a middle-aged tree, really yellow and peeling, kind of looks like paper birch, but much uh, more yellowish brown. And again, if we go down and look through the leaves here, we're seeing a much longer, broader leaf, really more reminiscent of beech or elm, although it, it has a nice even base compared to elm. Um, but uh, a lot of variety in our, in our birch trees here. And if we go through, here we go. We're seeing yellow birch. There's that bark again. Great look there. That's that, that image I used in the slideshow. More yellow birch bark. As the tree ages, uh, that, that tree on my background on my iPad is actually an old, old yellow birch that I found uh, way down east out in the middle of nowhere deer hunting one day a few years ago. Beautiful tree. Love that shot. You can see all those old peels, how they've uh, really kind of uh, matured, and there's moss growing all over that tree. It's just an awesome awesome old specimen there so there you have it uh yellow birch we've got our three birches we've got paper birch we've got uh paper birch here gray birch with that uh wide base and long tapering end and finally yellow birch uh, batula alleghaniensis all right one more uh let's take a look we got two more trees left here is a classic main um early successional tree a tree that's going to show up half very first uh, after a disturbance, and this is quaking aspen. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of Mainers that call this tree quaking aspen. In Maine, for whatever reason, everybody calls this tree poplar. So you'll hear uh, your family members or people around talking about poplar trees, and what they're talking about are quaking aspen. Now, uh, quaking aspen is very fancy sounding, and around the nation, places like Colorado are known for their aspens in the Rocky Mountains, and they call them aspen, quaking aspen, yes. In Maine, it's poplar. And really, uh, you know, deep Maine uh, traditions, people will call it popple. You'll hear it just say popple. And uh, a lot of old timers I've heard refer to this tree as popple. And what they're talking about is quaking aspen. And this is populus tremuloides and that popple comes from that populus uh, genus and tremuloides uh, is an easy one to remember because that quaking or people also call it trembling aspen one of the neatest things is the petiole do you notice how long and skinny that petiole is if you had it in your hand you'd find that it's flattened like very very flat and that petiole catches the wind any wind i'm talking the, the slightest breeze the wind catches that petiole and the whole tree looks like it's trembling or quaking. And there'll be days when we get outside later on this spring when this tree's leafed out, it feels like there's no wind at all. None of the other leaves are moving on the trees and you look up and there's a quaking aspen and the whole thing is just trembling. And that's because the slightest breeze will uh, move those leaves around, hence the name quaking aspen. I think this is an easy one to remember. That leaf to me looks exactly like a guitar pick. I always tell kids, look at that thing. It looks like a guitar pick, classic shape. Uh, the, ve the veins on it are really interesting. It's definitely a pinnate leaf, um, but it's got veins unlike any other leaf that, that we're going to learn and very guitar pick shape uh, there. Um, so uh, the bark on these younger trees that we're going to see around is really, really smooth and almost kind of green. And as they age, it becomes a little more rough. We actually have a couple real old ones uh, uh, out by the railroad tracks that we'll check out at some point. Um, but for now, uh, most of the ones you find around are real young, really super smooth bark. Um, and this is a really important food for wildlife. Deer and moose love to eat the foliage and the buds. It makes awesome cover for rough grouse and uh, pheasants and woodcock and all kinds of other game birds and wild turkeys and uh, snowshoe hare. Beavers eat the bark and the foliage. It's a really important tree for uh, beavers, their preferred food source, in fact. Um, really important tree. Uh, disturbance in the main forest is an important thing because it creates the opportunity for growth of these kind of species which feed a lot of wildlife. We need that disturbance out there to maintain biodiversity and we're going to come back to that next class but that quaking aspen, man I love that tree. That one's going on the tattoo list too actually. I, I need a quaking aspen leaf somewhere. Uh, maybe on top of my foot. That'd be kind of a cool spot for a quaking aspen uh, tattoo. But I digress. Let's, uh, let's continue on here. Uh, our last one is black cherry and this one uh, is pretty easy to remember scientific name wise because of that that uh that prunus genus i think of prunes prunus prunes and i think of fruit the cherry tree and these guys do actually produce cherries prunus serotina the black cherry and uh i can't say black cherry without thinking of that old rock song black betty whoa black cherry pam 
I don't know why I think of that, but I do. This is getting weird. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to hate listening to myself on this one, but uh, let's keep going. Black Cherry, uh, we're talking about Prunus serotina. It's got long elliptical leaves. Look at that thing. That's a pretty easy one to remember. Super pinnate, long and elliptical, shiny on top. Um, the bark on these trees is really kind of reddish brown. We'll see that when we go outside. And if you were to flip this uh, leaf over, it's got these kind of rusty orange hairs right along the mid vein on the back of the leaf. You can't see it there, but maybe we'll check it out in a minute here on Google Images. Um, but another one that loves early successional habitat, a recent clearing in the woods. And uh, what I see on these a lot is they are the preferred, foods, preferred food source of uh, tent caterpillars, which are a native uh, caterpillar here in Maine. A lot of you have probably seen them in your yard. And it's a classic sign of a black cherry tree. Honestly, it's a pretty good chance you're looking at a black cherry tree. If you see one of those big tents up in the tree full of caterpillars, they love black cherry leaves. They also like gray birch and some other ones, but black cherry is really preferred. And we certainly have plenty of black cherry in the TA forest and many of them will have uh, caterpillar tents in them this spring. And we'll, we'll check them out when we get out there. Um, let's go back uh, and take a look at uh, Prunus serotina here on Google Images. And we can see uh, some of the leaves here and the fruits they produce. These are edible. Uh, I wouldn't call them good, but they are edible. Um, and the fruit is mainly pit. Like that looks like a nice berry to eat. What's uh, hard to realize is that in there, the majority of that is a seed. There's a little tiny coating of fruit around the outside of a seed. So if you went to bite into that real hard, you could really do a, some damage to your tooth. But wildlife love them. The birds eat those things like crazy. As soon as they ripen on the tree, they're gone. Uh, and of course, those birds are going to fly away and they're going to uh, turn that fruit into uh, poo and rain that down on the forest and plant more black cherry trees all over the place. It's uh, dispersed by birds, so that's kind of cool. Um, so here we go. We'll go along and look at black cherry here. We're seeing those long, there's the blossoms in the spring, but we're seeing a long elliptical leaf, uh, very characteristic of black cherry, and really we're not going to look at any other leaves in the main woods that look anything like it. Here's a good look at uh, what that bark's going to look like. We see kind of dark brown bark. Um, but yeah, black cherry, prunus serotina. We'll go back to Nearpod here. That's it uh, for today's trees. Those are our first five trees. Now, what I'd like to have you do for an assignment today is uh, you're going to do uh, a species profile, much like we've done with maple and oak. Um, you're going to pick one of our three birch trees, either do paper, gray, or yellow birch. Um, and let's see here. I've got it open in... Uh, notability already, I believe. And here we go. Yeah, you guys know the deal with, with uh, the profiles. Tell me the common name. Tell me the scientific name. Um, find a nice uh, diagnostic picture of your species here. And then uh, give me a national range map. Where do we find them in North America? Give me some preferred habitat stuff. Uh, Forest Trees of Maine is your best friend here. That's got all kinds of good stuff on preferred habitat. Remember, the woods is not an acceptable answer. Some human uses, again, right out of your Forest Trees of Maine book. They're going to list a whole bunch of human uses for each of these trees. And then values to wildlife. Do a little bit of research online. Show me what you've learned here. Give me a sentence or two that's specific. Show me some things you learned. Again, food, cover, those are not acceptable answers. I'm looking for specifics. What species rely on these trees and how so? Show me you've done some research. So, um, that's it for our first day of remote learning here. Uh, you've got your assignment to work on. I'm going to post the Kahoot link so you guys can start practicing the ID here. And uh, yeah, um, I'm available via email. Reach out to me. I'll be here all day. Whatever you guys need, I'm here to help you. And uh, looking forward to getting back together here in the future. But for now, we're going to have to do this remotely.